Welcome to another edition of the Resilient Living Podcast, a show dedicated to improving quality of life for both people and planet through liberation and independence, moving from surviving to thriving and living life on your own terms. Today on the show, we have an individual who is very, very interesting by the name of Joseph Lofthouse. Joseph Lofthouse is the author of Land Race Gardening, and in his book and his expertise, he is going to teach you guys how to breed your plants, your vegetables, and trees to not be so susceptible to molds, funguses, insects, animals, everything. You see, I don't know about you guys, but in my line of gardening, I am battling pests left and right. It is a major, major problem, and I think that we have things backwards. And I know that we have things backwards, according to the work of Joseph Lofthouse. So he's coming on today to show you guys a complete different life-changing way to grow your own food in, a, in, a, in ways you never could imagine. I mean, just to give you guys a little uh, spoiler here, he has bred plants that are resistant to skunks. So this man's work is, to me, very, very underrated. It is re it's something that can change the world, I think, as we know it. I don't think very many people realize the power of this man's work, about what he's doing. Let's just jump right in today uh, with that. Welcome, Joseph Lofthouse, the Resilient Living Podcast. All right. So, Joseph, so nice to meet you in person. Likewise. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you on this podcast and the show and to uh, talk a lot about your book. What do you well, think? Thank we, you. You're welcome. What do you think we introduce people to what land race seeding is first? How about that? Okay. Well, when I first started farming, uh -huh. I was I was just opening a seed catalog and choosing a variety based on a beautiful picture and a and a fancy description. And when the seeds got to my farm, I didn't know if they were going to live or if they were going to die, mm -hmm. and if they'd be too long season and and it was just a mess. About 75% of what I planted would just plain old not grow. Yeah. And so I started looking for a different way to do things. And in my searching, I found a corn that was called a land race. Mm -hmm. And what the, what the developers of the corn had done is they had taken 200 varieties of corn and allowed them to cross pollinate in a field. Yeah. And then they sent that corn to me and some of that corn did wonderful and yeah. some of it did really badly. But there was so much genetic diversity in that crop that I was able to save the seeds from what really thrived for me mm -hmm. and and replant those and and so what I think of a land race as being is a crop that is genetically diverse, um, promiscuously pollinating, and locally adapted. Yeah. And, and because it can undergo survival of the fittest selection to really thrive with my conditions, whatever they are, and as they change from year to year. Yeah. That's absolutely perfect. And, th and that's so important. You're, you're, when I stumbled across your work, I was astounded because we have, you know, so much uh, pressure with pests and diseases and things. And it seems like gardeners, the farmers, the people all over are constantly having to spray and fight nature, uh, you know, working against nature. And what you've done is you've come in here and you started to breed these plants to, to, survive the biomes in the different environments that we live in and that we don't need pesticides we don't need herbicides we i mean you even from what i've heard is uh you've bred plants that skunks and and uh other animals don't want to eat that's amazing yeah my my corn yeah i just let the skunks and the raccoons take whatever they wanted out of the corn patch yeah for several years in a row saving seeds only from that, those that survived the skunks and the raccoons. Yeah. And so what that ends up doing is selecting for plants that are resistant to the skunks and raccoons. 
And one thing that it did is it raised the, the height of the cobs off of the ground from about three feet up to about five feet. Yeah. And so that also makes it easier for me to pick. Oh, yeah. And I think one thing that happened with the commercial seed industry is the seed producers and the plant breeders were selecting for plants that require pesticides and herbicides. They can't grow if there's weeds in the garden. They can't yeah. grow if there's bugs in the garden. And then when they when they send those seeds out to small scale gardeners and farmers that don't want to poison their fields and their families, they don't thrive because they're missing a critical part of the of what they were depending on. Seems like a pretty good lucrative business, huh? <laughs> Sell oh, yeah. us a bunch of plants <laughs> that that are, that are just like little babies sitting there, just completely susceptible to everything. Right. Well, another thing I don't do is I don't fertilize my gardens. Yeah. I put compost on. And by doing that, I'm selecting for plants that can thrive without those fertilizers. Yeah. And it saves me money as a farmer, saves me the labor. Um, and then because my plants know how to grow in low fertility, if I send the seeds out to somebody that has more fertility in their garden, then they can really thrive. Yeah. But they're not no pikers for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've got your book right here and it is amazing. And I think that, I think that this is, com is not, uh, it's overlooked. I think that it's very powerful what you are doing because we are, I mean, we're taking away, it takes time as nature, as you and I both know, na nature takes time for everything to, to adapt and to acclimate and everything. And we try to forcefully turn nature to do what we want it to do. But when I think of spin farmers, when I think I've got a list of backyard gardeners, survivalists and preparedness people, uh, I mean, the list goes on uh, full farmers. If people were to practice and uh doing doing the land racing that they can learn right here in your book i mean that changes a lot i mean this is a big part in my opinion to saving the the uh the planet as far as feeding people and instead of sending them money and instead of sending them these little shelters and things if what if we started teaching people to land race you know through through the the evolution of the the i'd say the natural technology that you've uh you're working on here that makes a huge difference in the world. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yes. Um, this is big. Well, when you start thinking about local plants, mm -hmm. you also start thinking about local communities and local seed savers and local ways of doing something. So you're not depending on a supply chain from far away, yeah. far away, far away, and any, everything that can go wrong in that. You, you start to adopt an attitude of, well, I can be growing my own food. I can be preserving my own food. I can be collaborating with the neighbors on mm -hmm. feeding each other. Because a lot of the food that I eat, I don't grow myself, but it's grown by my neighbor. Yeah. Because, and... And so when you just when the land race mindset starts settling on you, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm part of a community. I'm part of the local ecosystem. Yeah. And you guys are doing that now, aren't you? With the, with as far as with the seed saving as well, are you working oh, yes. with other people in your area and your biome to to save seeds and swap amongst each other? Yes, um, that's been really valuable for me. Yeah. To, to be swapping seeds with local community members. Um, some people have a passion for, for one species or another. And, and I tend to be a generalist doing like a hundred species. Yeah. <laughs> some of these people that focus on, on one species can really, really advance my work a lot. And oh, yeah. the work of the local community. It's very powerful if everybody spread out and started doing, as you said, different varieties and different things. I've been trying to create a community that way here, learning a lot from reading your book here, the, the uh, 
land race gardening. And uh, it's just, I can't find too many people in San Diego where I live here to, to get involved, but we're slowly, slowly trying to get them together. But uh, yeah, I think this, this is um, like, I want to get people excited about your book. And I know the first thing, which a lot of people do uh, or are interested in is money. And I look at, I said, if you were able to grow these seeds and learn from your Joseph Lotzow's book or the land race gardening, and you were able to breed them for your bio, that means that you outperform burpee, everybody, you can either give these seeds away and with community, but if someone wanted to actually start a business selling seed, why would, would anybody want to buy from Home Depot or these other seeds from back East or West or wherever, when you could have these superior growing seeds that skunks and, you know, and, uh, the resistance to, to uh, diseases and most of the pests and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's uh that would be a really, uh, a good uh, um, investment for people to do and well, be helping the earth and everything as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of room for thousands of small independent seed producers yeah. in every community, in every Valley, you know, in, in each eco region and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of room. It's it's fascinating. It just seems it's like a, a it's such a liberty and freedom thing, it seems like. If once we had, you know, I, I guess what it takes you is the magic number is three years to actually start developing your plants to where you have a, a land race good uh, genetics for your area. Do that work and once it's done, it's it's done, right? Right. Well, they continue to get better for as long as you grow them. Yeah. You know, but but I really think of three years as the magical year because yeah. the first year, all of the plants that are simply not going to grow, they just die. Yeah. You know, and then the survivors might cross with each other. And so the second year, you get the survivors cross with the survivors. And then that that third year, you can really see the which are thriving just much better than either of the any of the parent varieties we're growing it just keeps progressing mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of like a um you and i talked briefly on the phone about this a, a spiritual aspect of of plants i see it where the, it's like a hard drive like a computer where the the let's say a mother um you know has grown and she is susceptible to drought and maybe powdery mildew and skunks. <laughs> yeah. So when she, she Jeanette, she'll send that information down to her baby because everything on the planet wants to live. It wants to survive no matter what. So it sends that, like we can say, a hard drive into its seed so that the next year, when those seeds are ready to pop, the mom is saying, this place is really dry. You need to drop those roots as soon as you can and as deep as you can. And because they're susceptible to all these different environments, it just keeps getting more and more fortified to where spiritually and energetically and informationally, the, these plants just become better and better and like, and more healthier and sturdier. Yes. And I don't know that I can attribute everything that happens in my garden to the Mendel genetics that's taught in school. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a lot more going on with the plants than, than just that narrow uh, scientific view yes. of the world. Yes, they. They. I. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, the the documentary, what plants talk about. Uh. -uh. It's so you got to see it, Joseph. It's so awesome. They show the the roots underground, how the 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 plants transfer information between each other. Uh -huh. And then, of course, with the fungal networks and everything else, there's just this whole thing that that when we do big science, you know, we need to understand they have no idea what's going on underground. There's a whole communication level and relationships with with plants. Well, an another thing that I think is happening is the plants, shall we say, genome isn't limited to the DNA. As the plant, I think it should also include the DNA of the viruses and the bacteria and the, oh, yeah. the other microbes because they're all interacting with that plant. Yeah. Sometimes when I share my seeds, I think I should also be taking a sample of my soil. 
Yes. And sending that with the seeds so that they'll still be at home wherever they end up at. Yeah, they have some family members and some yeah, something comfortable. <laughs> and, yeah. And and so when I see someone sterilizing their seeds and all this sort of like we're gonna control every single possible thing we can about the seeds. Yeah. I think there's a lot of damage to to the natural way that the seed wants to be. Yeah. I mean, it's memory and is it that to me it seems like a lot of these high uh commercial grade seedlings and stuff they're grown in in um like you said sterilized environments with like fans on them and fake lights and misters and all those kind of things is that why you know we get so many problems it seems like on the forums and a lot of people i meet they'll get these beautiful green plants from like home depot or the nursery and then they put them in their ground and they just they get abolished <laughs> well so I reviewed the the growing procedures for a seed company. Mm -hmm. This is a seed company that that I'm I I'm part of the the seed company, and one of the farmers in the seed company was growing on plastic, over plastic, under plastic, yeah. and so what they're ending up doing is they're selecting for plants that require plastic to grow. Yeah, and then they get oh, into interesting. To some place like my farm where I don't grow on plastic. I don't yeah. want plastic. I think it's poisonous. Yep. You know, and so so they don't grow for me. They don't thrive because they're missing an essential part of of what they require. Cause because yeah. what I've noticed is that plants adapt to whatever is going on in their environment. Mm -hmm. They adapt to my um, habits as a farmer, the yeah. adapt to my high altitude, my low humidity, my high pH soil. Um, and then when they go somewhere different, then they don't have the tool set to be able to deal with that. Yeah. They have to start all over again, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the benefits of growing land race varieties where there's a lot of genetic diversity is that when they get to a new place and they have to start over, then they have some genetic tools to, to be able to do that. Yeah. Where some of these varieties, like the heirlooms, they were beautiful varieties 50 years ago on a farm 2,000 miles away. Yeah. And, and when they come to my farm, they just don't thrive because I don't live in the humid east east of the u.s yeah um and so so but if we cross a number of those heirlooms and let them rearrange their genetics so that they can figure out what works for me then that's a really good uh a really good strategy for getting some locally adapted varieties oh yeah so a, a lot of people I think have been fighting so long to try to, in the words of, of Mark Shepard, we're trying to keep alive. what wants to die and kill what wants to live. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems, and, and he's Mark Shepard has done that with his uh, trees and, and a, a lot on large scale farms, uh, huge scale farms. And it seems to me, the only person I've heard doing that with vegetables successfully is, uh, is from what I've heard from, from you, from the information. So you've taken, regular old uh, um, tomatoes and sunflowers, potatoes and things like that. And just genetic, just put them there. Like you said, tomato heirlooms is a place where things come, where heirlooms come to die, right? And you're on your farm. <laughs> yeah. Which is right. probably mind boggling to people. But as they, as they progress here, then we, we uh, have something that's just, that's adapted and completely superior. There'd be a lot less work and a lot more food. I can't, I can't stress enough that this information I look at is so important. It should be front. You should be on front page news, Joseph, <laughs> <laughs> getting this thing off the ground. Let's help some gardeners not have to work so hard. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, I don't like weeding my garden Yeah. because that's labor and it's effort. And mm -hmm. some years ago, I lost 
a crop of carrots because I couldn't keep it weeded because the seedlings are these little teeny yeah. tiny things. The weeds just come up big and bald. And so I, I said, I'm not going to weed my carrots anymore. And so I grew a crop of carrots and I let the weeds grow however they wanted to grow and harvested whatever little teeny carrots were in the row at the end of the year, yeah. replanted those. I did that two or three years in a row. And now what I have is I have carrots that can grow. They can outcompete the weeds. They grow these, these great big, huge tops that are two feet tall. Wow. The carrots will be like three pound carrots, just big, bold, rambunctious. Oh, yeah. And, and now when I weed my carrots, it's easy because the, the carrots are competing well with the weeds. And then they can do really well if I weed them, say, once early in the season. Yeah. But, but they're getting big enough, fast enough that, that it's just a joy. Oh, yeah. So are these, is it possible, do you think, to get some of these seeds from, say, back east or wherever and begin land racing on the, the uh, so say you grow, you have one, one set of species, like from Berkey or something like that. And pretty much everything dies. Is it possible that you keep growing and growing that same variety? trying to without diversification like say arugula we've got one species like like for me i'd have to probably go out there and spend some money or find some people who have a bunch of different different types of arugula so can i take like an arugula plant from say uh, from from berkey or someplace and plant that in the ground and just keep saving those seeds will they eventually adapt to uh, my my biome here and become land raised so it depends on how inbred they are to start with Okay. Because if they have no diversity to start with, then you're just going to get essentially the same plant, just yeah. a clump of itself repeating. But if there's some diversity, whether you like it or not, those are going to be self selecting yeah. to grow better at your place. And so some of the older heirloom varieties do have that kind of diversity, like okra. Mm -hmm. Is it? crop that has a lot of inherent diversity in it and i've really liked working with that and but something like a, say a bean mm -hmm. which is sleep inbreeding species yeah they, they more or less stay the same year after year after year yeah. um but if you can say plant two different varieties of arugula from two different sources that are unrelated. Yeah. Then you have enough, you might have enough diversity that they can start becoming locally adapted quicker. Yeah. Quicker. It, uh. it, 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 it's kind of a lot, a genetic lottery about what's going to grow for me. Yeah. And, and if there's more, say more, uh, genetics in the lottery then things can adapt adapt faster to my local conditions yeah and, and what's amazing is once you get your plants to survive and to and to start growing then you just start selecting for flavor right oh yes <laughs> yeah now it's and, like okay everything's living but what tastes the best uh-huh <laughs> that, that's been one of one of the joys for me of land race gardening because I'm selecting for exactly the flavor that I love. Yeah. Exactly. I, I love my my dark yellow, dark orange vegetables because of the high carotenes. Yeah. It just makes my heart sing. And and the sugars or the the acids or whatever it is, I j it just pleases me so much. What are some of your favorites that you've grown? Like the best of the best. Well, so one of the first crops I worked on was cantaloupes. That's okay. what I started calling them. Yeah. W right at the beginning, because that's mm -hmm. what they were called in the seed catalogs. And they were like, like the first year I planted something like 30 varieties. Mm -hmm. And I harvested five or six uh, green fruits at the end of the season. The second year I planted 
seeds from those and a few others. And, and there were two plants that produced more fruit than the hundred other plants all combined. Oh, wow. And so, so then I took those in the third year that became the, basically the ancestors of my entire cantaloupe project. Then I started selecting for flavor and yeah. aroma and beauty and, and just, just to make my heart sing. Yeah. So I, I don't call them cantaloupes anymore. Now they're musk melons. Musk melons. The aroma and the, the flavor is just yeah. oh, so wonderful and so soft. <laughs> That's what I, on the, I, I spin farm off somebody else's property and uh, meaning I pay for the water and give food to the, the uh, homeowners there. And they said, hands down, they asked to just anything we can do to keep you here the, because the food you're giving us is incomparable to anything out in, in the grocery stores or in some cases, even the farmer's markets. So uh -huh. I always tell if you're going to do the elite of the elite, I would say, Pay attention to land racing, not if, if not for good of the earth or money or anything else. You're just for the flavor, like you said. Eat something <laughs> that will make your heart sing. It seems so, like, oh, yeah. So, so some years ago, the university uh, conducted a survey of my customers. Uh -huh. And one of the questions that they asked is, why do you buy Joseph's vegetables? Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, because they're organic. Yeah. Oh, because local no the number one reason people said they buy my stuff is for the flavor yeah uh, i never knew that you yeah know? but of course i knew it because every year i taste the fruit of every plant before i save seeds from it yeah and if i don't like the flavor i don't save the seeds yeah and so just it was just beautiful to finally figure out why people are really buying my stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. That's where I look at spin farmers. I just produce my own food for consumption. I don't really sell it. But somebody who was spin farming for restaurants, I could see that, you know, establish yourself. You know, I'm going to say it again. Get get the book. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it in there intermediately all, as much <laughs> as I can. But if somebody was doing spin farming like I'm doing and selling to these fancy restaurants, it would blow them away. I think it would uh -huh. blow their taste buds right out of their mouths. They'd go, what the heck am I eating? It seems yeah. like for me, when I started growing my own food, I equate it to like having a, like I had a cold for like 15, 20 years of my life being living in the city away from the farm. Like I couldn't taste my food. Once I grew my food, I said, oh, I remember. Uh -huh. So I see a, a really huge deal where if somebody was to spend the three years, like you say, land race and, and get stuff that you don't have to work that hard. Like you said, your carrots, you don't even have to really weed. Uh, I mean, if, if any at all, but the flavor that sells itself or just for your family. But yeah, I really would recommend if people would, if spin farmers would pair up and uh, with, with the uh, uh, growing, the, growing their food on the spin farms, but also doing this land race there, that would be a business that's not going to go anywhere. Uh -huh. I really think you, you spin farmers listening, you guys might want to check this out because I'm flabbergasted. And like you said, Justin, I, my heart sings when I have those, those flavors. One of my personal favorites right now is my arugula and especially the arugula flowers. Oh, oh yeah. Enough of the flowers. They're so good. <laughs> Adrian, could you define spin for me? Oh, spin farm is basically where, uh, uh, I don't own land. So I go to somebody else's who does have land and I say, Hey, can I grow food on your property? And they says, yes, well, there needs to be some sort of exchange. So I say, well, I'll pay for all the water that I use. I'll maintain a certain section of your, 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 your property for you, such as weeding and things like that. And then I'll give you a basket at every harvest. So the beauty is that a lot of, I've been trying to, on my end here, we've been trying to save seeds, practicing. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm in the kindergarten of learning your land race things. But we've been <laughs> saving seeds to, you know, the old saying, give somebody a fish and you fed them, but teach them how to fish, you fed them for life. So I've been trying to develop a free seed bank where we're able to, uh, at this my spin farm location, where we can give to poor people and people who need it and uh, teach them how to grow their own food. So, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of exciting stuff. I, I often call myself a vacant lot farmer. 
Yeah. So I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> if you see a vacant uh, lot and you get on it, huh? Aren't you doing yeah. that right now? You're you're on your farm, right? Well, my my farm is is a, a vacant lot. Yeah. That belongs to somebody else. And oh, okay. So yeah. I, I've been there for 12 years and the landlady died. And I just kept farming it and taking care yeah. of it because that's what you do. And four or five years later, the family finally got hold of me. And <laughs> yeah. You know, but in the meantime, I was just nurturing and loving on the on the place and yeah. taking care of it for whoever came along later. Yeah. Who's going to come home and say, get all these vegetables off this yummy, delicious. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> the aromas. Yes, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but what I found is when people say that they, they can't farm because they don't have land, there's oh, yeah. big land laying all over everywhere. Yes. And it's a burden to its owners. Yeah. They don't want to maintain it. They don't want to mow it, mitigate the fire hazard, yes. keep the weeds down. And and someone that'll come in and say, I'm going to love on this piece of land. Mm -hmm. People just want that for their land. They long for somebody to yes. be able to take care of their land. Yeah, I would love to inspire people. That's what I'm looking at the people who can't afford food and things like that. Do like what I've done. Just go on Facebook and go on there's friends of different cities um mm -hmm. where you live in paradise right right i didn't realize you were in paradise joseph <laughs> must be nice <laughs> living in paradise <laughs> it's beautiful yeah but if they went to you know go to facebook go to the friends of whatever paradise where you're at and just ask on there i'm looking to grow food and uh on your property and do an exchange and there's so i had probably about 40 to 50 offers of people uh, offering their land up to me. When I went, they asked me, please pick us, please. They were begging me, please do that. I just went for the <laughs> most beautiful, the flattest, of course. And my plot has a forest behind it, which is very hard to find here in North County, San Diego. So I have frogs and I have all kinds of critters that are coming and eating all of my darn food. <laughs> and I mean, some of them, they're mowing down a lot of it. <laughs> and there's a lot of people out here, uh, and I'm sure everywhere in the United States of the world, for that matter, are experiencing what I'm doing, you know, where, or what I'm experiencing here, where you grow food and half of it seems like it's for the wildlife. Sometimes right. I don't even get to eat anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how could we help backyard farmers, uh, with, with your, uh, without giving too much away of your book, how do you think we can help out backyard farmers with your your land race, Joseph? Well, I think one of the most important messages from my book is that we can do this stuff ourselves. Yeah. We can have local varieties that really thrive under local conditions. Mm -hmm. And we don't need science degrees. We don't need to keep records. We just need to be growing stuff, saving the seeds, loving on it. It's yeah. loving on us. and and be part of the ecosystem rather than the ecosystem being something that we have to control and manipulate. Yeah. And, and, but yeah, I'll just end there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like we've, we've had it backwards for so long. We've all been fighting and making na nature's become an inconvenience and this obscene thing that's in our way. And that's what I love about the spiritual and philosophy uh, without getting too twilight zone on everybody. But if we switch our mindsets around and thinking about what you've done, we're not fighting nature anymore. We're not doing anything really. We're just letting things die off that don't want to live there. Letting these genetics happen the way they're supposed to without mathematics and science and all of these things, we without a measuring tape. And then things start to thrive. In fact, we have, we have beauty in our lives again, and we have flavor. I think it's... Yeah. It, Instead of spraying pesticides, and imagine if people just did a little bit of this, just 10% in each one of their gardens in the major cities, how much diversity and in, in the bugs and the animals and things that we can change. And you don't have to fight the birds. You don't have to fight anything, really. Right. Yeah, you've, you're, you're designing this where you don't have to fight anymore. Well, let's well, see. One of the things that I'm, that 
maybe aggravates people about my methods is I welcome the insects and the blights and the diseases and the rots because those are my friends. They're my companions. They're teaching my plants how to thrive and how to survive. And, and they're just so useful to me as a, as a plant breeder and as a farmer, because something's going to survive. Yeah. Something's going to figure out how to, to work. And, and then the children of that get even better at it. Yeah. Of course, I'm, I'm still not growing citrus up yeah. here high in the mountains in minus 20 below. Yeah, that's impossible. So, so there are there are limits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, I heard, uh, is that, well, you were training the bugs. So the bugs, if, if correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, these bugs will come and start eating your plants and you'll make a deal with them and say, hey, if you guys go back to your natural stuff, you know, which your, your indigenous weeds and things like that, leave my vegetables alone, then we won't wage war. So what you, I think what, what it was, was you were removing certain species of plants that they like to eat so that genetic, after you kept doing this and doing this, like almost starving them out, they said, well, forget it. Joseph's being a meanie, taking away all the <laughs> corn and everything. We might as well go back to that, that they just kind of forgot about uh, the, the plants that you're growing, right? In a, in a, in a roundabout way. So the Colorado potato beetles in my garden will mm-hmm. not touch a potato plant. Yeah. Because I grow their native species in my in my garden. Uh-huh. Well, it's a weed. I couldn't get rid of it if I wanted. But so my contract basically goes, I'm not going to poison you. Yeah. I'm not going to kill you as long as you eat my weeds. Yeah. But if I see if I see you on a potato plant, I'm going to squash you. Yeah. And and that works because they're a local res- a local year-round resident. Yeah. And the mothers have taught their children mm-hmm. what their species is. Mm-hmm. And so the bugs are kind of being culturally or genetically or both conditioned to eat my weed. And if I have a potato plant that two or three times during a season attracts the beetles, yeah. then I'll kill the potato plant. Yeah. I, I don't want the contract to get messy and mixed up. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's a beautiful, but I also have like squash bugs. Yeah. And I was kind of, what's the saying? You're not supposed to laugh at someone else's misfortune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one year I, I, had a helper in my garden and she asked if she could plant some squash. Yeah. I said, sure, go ahead. And so she, she planted some zucchini squash in my field. The squash bugs came and there's like hundreds and hundreds of squash bugs on her plant. And they just devoured her whole crop of zucchini. Yeah. And I'm like, they don't even touch my squash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, Yes, I see them in the garden and they exist, and I know they exist, you know, but they a hundred of them don't come in and consume one plant. Yeah. And so I kind of I kind of laughed at her misfortune or just, just <laughs> felt just felt satisfied to see with yeah. my own eyes that how effective land race gardening is. Oh yeah, you're the the uh, beetle whisperer apparently. Apparently. <laughs> so so how would how do you think that would have, like one of the, the things i look at in my life would be so awesome to um to inspire and to make a difference in, in large scale and i think backyard gardeners in cities are there's a lot more of them than us us uh simple folk you know out in the prairie growing food how do you think in a in a in a simple manner that people in the city i'm sure they would be interested in doing this how would they just get around to organizing something as far as doing land race and backyard so, gardening? So the the main thing required from land race gardening is that you save your own seeds. Mm-hmm. And preferably that you save your own seeds from varieties that have some genetic diversity. Mm-hmm. And, and for some crops like, say, tomatoes yeah we're harvesting the fruits at the same time that we're 
the seeds are, are ready to harvest at the same time the food is. Yeah. You know, so that's simple and easy. Yeah. Um, like beans, like dry beans are another crop that the food is harvested at the same time as the, as the, the seeds. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's a crop that's easy to work with. Some of the crops like the, say the turnips or the beets take a two year cycle yeah. to produce seeds. And so that's a little more complicated for the backyard gardener. Yeah. But it's still doable. I yeah. mean, I can put, five or six or 10 or 20 turnip plants in a little corner of the yard somewhere and just let them flower all yeah. the, whole, the whole season. Even if they had to container gardening, they uh -huh. grow your food in container. One of the things I look at, it'd be nice is if people did container gardening, they would able to be able, I've tried this with my farm, but I don't have enough interested people yet, but you can give them a plant in a container and say, go land race this at your place. You can inter swap these things. And there's, there's, there's uh -huh. so many ways. Right. Well, there's there's a concept called a seed library uh -huh. where somebody grows seeds and they put it in a library and people come and take seeds out. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to return the seeds to the seed library. And I hear a lot of people all upset, like, well, what if it gets cross pollinated? Yeah. And I'm, How beautiful. Because yeah. then it's one step closer to being locally adapted. Give me you know, some of those seeds. <laughs> uh, just what a beautiful, glorious thing if it does get cross-pollinated. Yeah. You know, the joy, I forgot because it's been many, many years living in the city, but I'm sure you can relate to this. The feeling in a human being when somebody gives you a package of seeds that they saved, that they work really hard and they give it to you and you're holding this in your hand. It's better than a million dollars, like the feeling, the heart warming that you give. And then when I gave to them, they were super excited. And it just, to me, if you need to wake up or you need to feel something in your life or feel joy, the fact of swapping those seeds is just, it's powerful. It's uh -huh. just so joyful. Well, I, I get that a lot because I'll send my seeds to someone in Connecticut yeah. And they'll grow them out and they'll send seeds back to me. Uh -huh. And it's like, how joyful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like you said, you never, it's the lottery. You never know what you're getting, the genetics and everything. Like, ooh, let's see what happens when we plant these in the ground and see what we get. <laughs> uh -huh. It's an adventure. Well, there's a, there's a pumpkin called the Seminole pumpkin. Uh -huh. And it, it is the ancestor of the butternut mm -hmm. squash. Oh, really? And, but it's from Florida. Yeah. And so when I plant Seminole pumpkin up here, it doesn't even get around to thinking about flowering before it's been frozen. Yeah. But I sent my landry seeds to a friend in California. He crossed my land race with the Seminole pumpkin and sent me seeds back. Oh, and wow. And so all of a sudden, I have the Seminole pumpkin as part of my land race. Because of a gift that somebody in California gave to me. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so yeah, there's a lot that backyard gardeners can do learning from your, your book. Uh, I think there'd be a lot more diversification uh, because there's just more people. Right. If you had, there's more people localized there. If everybody was doing so many different things, like you said, specialized in, in just one, if it's a complicated, just try one, but read the book and, and, and listen to, uh, you know, what Joseph has to say here and just get, get the gist of things and then run from there. So uh, let's like, I, uh, we opened up, I said, this is good for, for spin farmers like myself to sell at, um, that to restaurant owners and the public and backyard gardens. How about the survivalist people out there and the preparedness people? What do you have to well, say on land race? Well, see, one of the things that the survivalists like to, to do is they like to take a package of seeds and they like, yep. like to put it in a box and they save it. Yeah. And that's going to be their survival stash. Yeah. But where were those seeds grown? They were grown maybe in China maybe in South America. Yeah. We don't have any idea 
what the genetics are, how they thrive in our local area. What I think the survivalists ought to be doing is they ought to be growing their own varieties right now, every mm -hmm. single year, so that they have locally adapted seeds, so that if there's a necessity, they know that their seeds are going to thrive because they're already thriving. Yeah. That, that's, that's huge. It's so big. Whether we're, you know, for, for the survivalists, you're, you're saving dried beans and rice and things like that. But this just keeps continuing going on and on. And how long, how many years are you going to be able to, to, to uh, keep those seeds before the, their lifespan is up and they start drying up? And the mm -hmm. fact that if everything went down, what a, per, a, a, a like a perpetual motion, getting the land raised seeds, you'll have food for the rest of your, your life. It'll just keep right. going and going. Get started. That's what that's what I think. This is very important. Uh, um, a very important development. I think we need to start adding to to gardening. Well, so, an, another uh, thing that has happened to me on the survival front when I started growing my own seeds is all of a sudden I have weeds in my garden that are edible. I oh have, wow! I have carrots. I have beets mm -hmm. that are. There are weeds in my garden, and what a beautiful thing to have yeah. weeds edible. I have the same right now here in California. I have a uh, uh, celery seeds just popping all over every so I have my, like I eat them like potato chips. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah, some stuff you it's almost like you can't get rid of it, huh? Right. Once it gets comfortable and, it, and it's been loved on and figures out what it needs to do, it's there to stay. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then then they are self-selecting. Yeah, for land growing conditions, mm -hmm. and I, I just stay out of the way. Well, I might do some mild selection. For for example, with my turnips, they the seed falls on the ground in the fall, and the the roots are about turnip sized. Yeah, by the time by the time winter arrives, and I didn't say that right, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> The turnips are about ping pong ball size by the time yeah. fall arrives. And so then in the spring, I'll take the largest of the ping pong ball turnips and I'll plant them in a row where I want them to go to seed at. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, just leave them alone and then. Yeah. And, and so I am doing some minor selection on them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've got, I planted uh, some indigenous plants here, some, so, well, the miner's lettuce. Uh -huh. And I also took some of the, I think from England, the corn salad, the mach. Oh, yeah. And I planted some of those and let them go to seed. And I have a, mine's like a vertical kind of garden thing with burlap. It's a, uh, it's all biodegradable and all that kind of thing. I bear, I'm like you, the, the least amount of, the only plastic I use is the irrigation lines. Uh -huh. Because those seeds were left alone, I have baskets that are just just blowing up with with uh much uh leaves and miners lettuce it's just this giant afro of green uh, growth <laughs> just popping out everywhere and i really hadn't didn't have to do anything for it at all just let it right. go yeah yeah it's amazing and not to say things like you have like daikon radishes and things like that if you just left them alone and they started growing in the soil, they're, they're going to make that place so fertile because they're giving food for all the worms and the microbiology and parting the soil open and uh -huh. like lazy composting. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just let them do their own thing. And then, and lazy gardening, you don't even have to plant them. They'll just keep showing up. So excellent for survivalists. Yeah. Right. So is there uh so how do you continue certain breeds, Joseph? Is there, so if people are wondering here, if uh, once you get your flavor and everything down, what do you, does it keep developing? Could you lose that flavor to where it would just say in five and 10 years from now, it would develop into something completely different. And then you got to start over again, or how does that work? So when I'm selecting for flavor, basically what I'm doing is I'm inbreeding. Uh -huh. And I, and so I'm getting rid of all of the traits that make for bad flavors. Yeah. And I mean, people have been doing that for 10,000 years with varieties. Yeah. So like, like we've got rid of most of the poisons, most of the thorns, you know, most of the bad flavors. Yeah. And so 
when we cross varieties that are lacking those poisons and thorns, they're not spontaneously recreating. Yeah. Um, we cross great parents with each other. We get great offspring. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm not finding that I lose flavors or, or stuff like that. It just gets better as the years go by. Wow. One more reason to land race. It just keeps going. Once you're done, you're done. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And, and I do include new, new traits in my land races from time to time. Yeah. You know, I, if I like see something, I plan it and I like it and it does well for me. I'll just in, include it in the land race next year. And, <laughs> but, but the thing is, I don't, I don't have to worry all of a sudden about plant purity and isolation distances and doing it wrong and, yeah. and all of that kind of stuff because I'm welcoming of diversity. I'm welcoming of, of, uh, instability. Yeah. Bring it on. Uh-huh. Yeah. It makes it, yeah. To get the sooner, the better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's so awesome because you're able to just for flavor, just start playing around with things. Gee, I think I'll introduce a little more spiciness. Gee, I might introduce a little more sweetness to the deal. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, like, like with my, my watermelons, um, I'm selecting for yellow watermelons. Yeah. Because the the red in a watermelon is a bitter flavor. Mm. It's, if I select against the red. Then I can have melons that are lower in sugar. Yeah. Still taste sweeter. Fascinating. And and because my growing season is really too short for watermelons. Yeah. To develop a lot of sugar, but they can develop, you know, a mid level of sugar. Yeah. And so I don't, if I don't have to compete with that red color, then, then a less sweet watermelon tastes better. You've got it made. But, you know, <laughs> that's an interesting point because where you live, the elevation and everything, uh, and the in the growing season, you only have what a, a, about I think like 90 days or something crazy. 90 where, days. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, to be able to grow stuff. Uh-huh. So if you're able to make that, it out in that environment, wow. Yeah. That that's 90 frost-free days, and there's some varieties that do really well in frosty weather, but yeah <laughs> not watermelons not what yeah i'd imagine you're not growing papayas out there or like uh-uh. i said citrus now i know some people have tried to grow papayas out here in san diego and i think they were really flat they just didn't want to take off uh-huh but but the thing that someone in san diego could do is they could plant ten thousand seeds of the papaya uh-huh and just see if there were 10 plants out of that that would thrive out there. Oh, yeah. That is that is great. Yeah, you just got to get plant a lot for diversity, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, a um, lot more than what you think. Right. Well, maybe not, but maybe so. Mm-hmm. It's a gamble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if you can start with a genetically diverse population to start with, then your odds are better. Yeah. Because if you're... If you're planting just seeds from one clone, you know, then whatever. Yeah. But if you're planting cross-pollinated seeds from a dozen different papayas, yeah, then, you know, who knows what might happen. Yeah. That's super and, smart. And when we start dealing with things like shrubs and trees. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be five years between generations or whatever, or 15 years. Yeah. But look at all the time in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm growing for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. We can time to do these projects. We've been farming for 10,000 years. I think we can farm for another 10,000. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's what's awesome. You're giving, what a gift that you could say that this walnut or this uh, mango tree was from my great great grandfather uh-huh. <laughs> the, the the 
the the spirituality of the, the connection of like wow this is what a gift that you can give somebody that just keeps going and going and going have you ever seen some of those mango trees how large they are and in some I, of the tropics I, I think they're just they're old just like 60 70 years old if memory serves me correct just this giant that someone may have planted and it just keeps giving and giving and giving yeah so uh, what advice could you give somebody to start like finding seeds to start their own land race project? Um, just plant what you love and yeah. plant two or three different varieties of what you love and allow them to cross pollinate. Yeah. And you would probably recommend though, that people get their hands on as many different, uh, at least two, like you said, but any advice on what to do, maybe create a community or what to, to go, Hey, is anybody out there with some, uh, like arugula seeds or, you know, some papaya seeds that want to swap? How do they get their hands on a larger diversity? So when I originally started, I was going to the farmer's market uh -huh. and the local farm stands, and I was just buying, buying locally grown fruits, locally yeah. grown squashes. And, and so even if those seeds were from far away, whatever they were, they had still grown in my community for one generation. Yeah. You know, and, and, and for me, that was a beautiful place to start. Yeah. But I mean, started a seed company if you want. Yeah. I buy two or three heirlooms and, and let them cross and see what happens. Yeah. Um, I also did a, we, we have some seed swaps here in my local community that are like producers only seed companies. Uh -huh. So if you didn't, if you didn't grow the seed yourself, it's not welcome at the seed, at the seed swap. Oh yeah. And, and so that's a beautiful way to, to get seeds. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so how does it working with your community there with the, the, the seed swap, you guys uh, uh, stay in touch, you guys organize things. You guys all found each other? So our, our biggest seed swap here is the Ogden Seed Exchange. Uh -huh. And we have a once a year um, get together in about February where we all take our seeds there and we, we swap them and the community comes and gets seeds. And then we have about five or six uh, meetings during the, the summer just for things like oh this is how we grow tomatoes and that kind of kind of yeah. thing yeah sharing some tips and tricks and everything uh -huh. I imagine yeah yeah that's awesome yeah i think that why do it all yourself right right yeah get 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 a diversity of people and and a whole bunch of different things going on and it makes things a lot funner well, well see when i was selling vegetables at the farmer's market i would also take my seeds with me yeah and and share those and people that one of the rules well not a rule one of the requests i had from people that buy my my produce is if there's anything that you buy that really tastes wonderful and amazing mm -hmm. bring this back to me and i'll grow them for next year yeah you know and, and so so we did that the restaurants that I was taking vegetables to was save the seeds from the squash. Yeah. And, and they'd save me a little piece of the squash as well so that I could taste it. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so that, that was an easy way to get the community involved. Yeah. And to get more diversity of those seeds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that's, that's the problem I have is trying to find, uh, uh, other people who, who are seed savers themselves. Uh, what about, do you have any, any advice on not giving away too much of your book on, on how to save your seeds? How do, how do you actually process them? Oh, saving seeds is the simplest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically there's two kinds of, two kinds of seed saving. One is in, from wet fruits. Yeah. And, and so those, I generally recommend that you ferment, you take the seeds out of the fruit. Mm -hmm. Put it in a jar for two or three days, let it ferment, maybe for a week. Yeah. Then rinse the seeds off and dry them. Dry them quick so that they don't mold. Yeah. 
And then the other way is um, to harvest seeds from dry plants. Mm-hmm. A method for that is basically harvest the plants, throw them on a tarp, jump up and down on them, yeah. sieve them, and then take the seeds and the chaff and winnow it. Yeah, which is, which is blowing blowing a breeze across, and the seeds fall straight down, and the yeah. chaff blows away. And so that's the two two basic seed saving methods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have bags of seeds. It's everywhere. I have them in my, on my dash. I have them underneath my car seat. I've got them all over. I have seeds falling in my bed while I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I the the worst for me is the flax seeds. Yeah, because when they get in my bed and then stick to my skin, I think I got a tick on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so is there anything in your book that uh you wish you would have added um so so one of the things that i added after the last round of beta readers is i added more uh comments directed at the backyard gardener oh okay if I had it to do over again, I would devote an entire chapter to the backyard gardener. Yeah. Um, because backyard gardeners, uh, this can really work well for. Yeah. And it, it's just a matter of getting out of the old way of, oh, we got to have our 50 plants in order to be genetically viable. And, you know, all that kind of yeah. worry and stress and record keeping and just drop all of that kind of stuff and just grow seeds. Yeah. You know, add a new variety once in a while for genetic diversity and and don't try to grow a clone of a clone of a clone. You know, but let the let the crops float back and forth and and just be joyful and happy instead of you know, all these rules and regulations that prevent us from saving seeds because we might do it wrong. It it seems like what you just said would help a lot of people because I meet people who say, you know, they have the old brown thumb. Uh I just don't have the green thumb. Uh No, I think that's what just really sucks about uh, what's happening in our society as far as getting people gardening is I think they're getting these seeds, they're planting them, and it's nothing that they did. It's the diseases in the soil and the things that just eats them off. So people get discouraged so quickly and say, well, that's it. I have a brown black thumb. I can't grow anything. (laughs) Well, one of my neighbors uh, whines to me that her seeds just don't grow. Yeah. And, And she waters them every single day and they just don't grow. And I like, well, I only water once a week and my stuff's just thriving. Yeah. And and so I ask her where she gets her seeds, and she says, oh, from Oregon. So it's damp, it's cloudy, yeah. it's overcast, it's low elevation, and it's no wonder her plants don't grow. Yeah. And it's not her fault. It's because she put the wrong seeds in the ground, the yeah. seeds that, that we're expecting wet and moist, and, yeah. and they just don't have it here. You know, what? The, the whole don't struggle message, it seems like what you're, you're putting out, it reminds me of uh, aquaponics when I started studying and I was a, a very avid aquaponicer. I'm not now for various reasons, but what was interesting is even live animals beyond, going beyond plants. What they found was the baby fish, they would put them in a sterile environment and like 90% of them would die. Then uh-huh. I met these people who says, no, we'll just get this big old giant, like a doughboy swimming pool, the above ground swimming <laughs> pools. And they put a net on the bottom. And they throw the mama and, you know, a couple mamas and a daddy in there. And they let the thing just turn with algae and complete dirty, filthy water, just green. You would say, yuck, that is disgusting. Well, when we need our so-called science to, to teach us about it, what they found was that when the babies are born, they inhale the water back and forth. So they would take pieces, pieces of the algae would go in their mouth and out of their mouth, in their mouth, out of their mouth. And they started to chew on it and go, oh, I get it. That's good. So they started eating. <laughs> they only lost maybe about five at the max, 10% of dead fish and had success on 90% because they were in a dirty, it was completely backwards. Uh-huh. Yeah. Out of the sterile environment, 
and into this filthy tub that that you would look at that's gross but they, they that's the way they live that's that's how they acclimate so so what i've discovered is a plant breeder is that about 80% of the selection that's going on in my garden uh-huh. has nothing to do with, with me as a farmer. Yeah. It's only about the ecosystem. Yeah. And and I have my little 20% influence that I can have on it. But by and far, most of the selection is just the ecosystem. Yeah. As, as far as sustainability, like what I like to say uh, on the show is, uh, plants and trees they never got any emails they don't really too concerned that there's a covid thing going on that maybe uh their bank accounts getting low or who's president who's not who's fighting who's not no they're just doing their thing they will continue they've continued they've been here before us they're going to continue after us right but what we can do is things like you're doing where we're just kind of introducing them back into the environment and and uh nudging it just a little bit if we're even doing that right joseph yeah. Well, like I grow mushrooms. Uh-huh. And when I first started growing mushrooms, I was sterilizing and I yeah. was you know, all this stuff. And then I'm like, this is stupid because yeah. mushrooms have been growing millions of years without any sterilization. Mm-hmm. And so I, I these days I only do outgrow mushroom farming. Yeah. You know, I'll take some spores and I'll put them where the Maybe they'll survive, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But when they do survive and produce fruit, that's like free food that I didn't even have to work for. Yeah, I went and bought some wood chips. I tried to make a fancy at my garden. Try to make uh-huh. a fancy area for YouTube and all that. So I bought, you know, those those red and brown ones they sell at the home at the hardware stores. I bought some of those and said, well. Let's make it look a little cleaner because mine looks like uh, it's not Martha Stewart. That's for sure. <laughs> there's there's chicken wire. I utilize. I built stuff out of recycled pellets. So uh, long story <laughs> short, built a little 10 by 10. And guess what popped up? Moral mushrooms out here in San Diego. Sweet. Yeah. Big <laughs> giant bushel. And they only la- at first when I looked at them, I said, I didn't have my mushroom book. And I says, I could swear that those are there's only one species that looks like that. But by, it gets so warm over here. But by the time I went, because uh, I only get to go to my garden once a week, once I uh, got back, they already dried up. But I looked them up and sure as heck, the spores must have traveled inside that bark from, say, back east or up north. And they grew. And I've been waiting for them to return. How beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So you, you never you never know. Uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I think you you might have to uh, you might have to add and write another book, Joseph. I hate to break this to you. Uh oh. I think you might have to do the backyard. What's that? (laughs) What do you think the topic should be? (laughs) I think you should aim at some back. I think right now the book that you have is is people need to get this thing. I think that uh, if we can promote this and get this out there, I mean, all the things we've been talking about today, I'm like, why not? This is this is literally. Don't they have a seed bank uh, somewhere like Switzerland or something like under like like a vault, and they're all oh, worried yeah. of like let's save the all world. these heirlooms and everything. Uh-huh. I heard something like that. But if we switch gears around, like you and I are saying, stop thinking that way, start land racing. You wouldn't need to have these seeds stuck and buried in a hundred feet of snow with Black Ops helicopters flying around them constantly, right? right? <laughs> Just let them let them uh, um, start doing what they need to do for each region. Mm-hmm. Yeah, super powerful stuff. I, I often think that the best seed bank is what's growing in my backyard. Yeah, and the best place to grocery shop. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you do any uh, food preservations like drying, dehydrating, canning, and all that kind of stuff? Since you're you're uh, um, grocery I for sure. Canning. You're into canning? Yeah. And, oh, okay. And so I, I do a lot of canning. I also really like harvesting like corn, beans, and grains for for food. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Like for an hour worth of labor, I can harvest enough wheat to feed myself for a week. Yeah. Or 
to put it the other way, for a week's worth of labor, I can harvest enough wheat to feed myself for a year. When I heard that, I was astounded. That's very good for the prepper survivor people. Yeah, what a powerful crop. Yeah. Yeah. And without, I think you said it, without any machines, you were just doing the whole, uh, just using yeah, the that, wind and a tarp. and The wind, a tarp, and a stick if I like to, to beat on them. Yeah, or jumping up and down with your bare feet. Oh, I put shoes on if I'm jumping on on uh, <laughs> grains because yeah. I've poked more than a few times. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, so is there some continuing things I'd imagine that you just you keep learning as as this whole thing progresses? Um, I always learn that that the. the plants want to live yeah if, if if i strip away everything else it's like life lives yeah and if i can just get out of the way and let it live it's going to live and do well yeah so just let it be mm -hmm. you know there's a uh i know that you're into yoga i don't know if you've ever heard of Sadhguru. Sadhguru's work i, I don't think so He's a he's a pretty uh, uh, um, well known yogi. One of the things he says is when troubled people come to him, and they they just they're very hard to get to. The first thing uh -huh. he does is say, "Why don't you just take your shoes off and go in the garden and garden?" <laughs> and for some reason, there's this. To me, I uh, I'm one of those weirdos who plays Beethoven and music to my plants. It just feels like they can when I'm there playing that it, it affects them, and the yeah. frogs and the insects and everybody, but. There's, there is this, this, if, if I just, again, not to get too twilight zoney, but if I just close my eyes and sit with my plants and I observe other people, I think it's beautiful how you'll notice when they walk, they gently touch the tips of the leaves or they'll run their hands over the wheat. There's uh -huh. this connection, I think, with the plants that a lot of people are, are missing a companionship. I mean, these are our friends. We've, we've lived with them. And, and just like, like you said, that they have, they have evolved. We've evolved as well with them. And I think yeah. there's a special thing just because they can't speak and move unless you, you, you watch such shows as uh, uh, what plants talk about. You can see this whole communication underground and things. There's a lot happening, I think, between us. How's your feelings on, on your relationship with your plants? So I always garden barefoot. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like the way I ought to be gardening. Yeah. And one thing I like to do sometimes, particularly like when I'm planting mushrooms, is I'll have this slurry that's the mushroom slurry, and I'll take that into my mouth and then plant it from my mouth to where it's yeah. going. Um, sort of sharing my microbiome with mm -hmm. the mushrooms, sharing it with the seeds that I'm planting. Yeah. Um, I used to think that was that kind of thing was woo woo, but yeah, you know, it, it just seems right and proper to be to be more intimately connected with my food. Yeah, yeah, I feel the the, the exact same way. I spit my seeds out all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> my my daughter does the same thing. I have a, a special needs daughter, and she'll go and she'll. Uh, Take, she likes playing with my onions, my green onions, when they go to seed, and she'll just kind of scatter them around, put them in her mouth, and spit them all over the place. Uh huh. Yeah. But yeah, you, you have to, when you, I think they call it grounding, right? When people take oh, their yeah. shoes off and just get in contact with the soil. But to take your shoes off, get grounding, contact with the soil, but start sticking your hands in it and be able to start eating that food. To lie, lay down in your garden, and take a little nap, which I've done myself, <laughs> watching all the animals and diversity. We're just You don't even have to move. You can just turn your head over and just grab a cherry tomato right off the bush. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that's one of my favorite things is like eating raspberries right off the bush without using yeah. my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you've ever seen, there was these Russians, I think, that hooked up these sensors to a plant and they had two plants and they had a woman come in and just rustle up. I mean, wreck the leaves of one plant. And they electrically found that the, um, like the, like a pulse. 
So they took the woman out. They took the 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 plant with it. Waited a, a day or two. I forget how, if memory serves me correctly. She comes back in, and as soon as that plant noticed that that was that woman, and it's it's electrodes, it's it's part starting. So if you needed science to sort of show you that yes, plants are connected with people, uh, it was an amazing, amazing scientific work that didn't really get much uh, much play out of it. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's amazing. I think like the whole story of mushrooms, how they uh, they present themselves in pathways and things for animals to eat, where the uh -huh. broken down wood chips and things are at. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's. I'm fascinated by that end of. Sometimes there's some people that actually believe that that the plants are almost controlling, especially the mushrooms, controlling the people of where yeah. they present themselves and and yeah, mushrooms are older than uh, most human beings. I think that they predate way, way, way far back. In fact, yeah. some suggest that they were, they might have po possibly come from space, like on asteroids or something. Uh, their DNA, their, it goes way back as, before dinosaurs. So, well, yeah. When I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of went out there. <laughs> well, I think you got a lot of, uh, a lot of good stuff in this book. Um, where can uh, people find this? Where can they find your book at? So lofthouse.com is my website. Uh -huh. And that has a list of huge long list of places where my book is available. Yeah. Basically, it's available any place that sells books, more or less. Okay. Um, just ask for it. Yeah. Okay, and they can find you on Facebook. Do you want us to divert people over to to share your information, your 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 message here? I love Facebook followers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I don't remember my Facebook address right now, but I'm the only Joseph Lofthouse with plants on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to get out there and put links to all this stuff down there and try oh, to and divert you. everybody over to you. And I think it would be wonderful to have you back on the show in any form or way if, if you cho so choose to. I think at top, off the top of my head, it would be interesting to talk about individualized species of what your recommendations are to wet people's whistle to get them starting to breed. As I know, there's I, from your book, from what I read, there's some different methods to do different uh, varieties, right? Right. Well, yeah. so there's the inbreeding crops and the outcrossing crops, mm -hmm. and those aren't fixed categories but they're sort of general categories and landrace gardening is a lot easier with the varieties that cross pollinate more 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 <laughs> more they're just more <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but but one of the varieties that i i have a lot of hope for is is promiscuous tomatoes yeah because the domestic tomatoes that we're, we're growing have been so inbred for so long that they have basically forgot how to grow. Yeah. Wow. And people really struggle to grow tomatoes. And, and so I'm working diligently on getting some promiscuously pollinating tomatoes so that they can figure out for themselves how to deal with blights and blossom and rot and all of yeah. those you know, insects and all of that kind of stuff. You have a very interesting way of, uh, of, of collecting the pollen from one of the videos I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> it makes total sense. Yeah. So I, so I use a vibrator yeah. to collect pollen because it mimics the, um, the vibration, the vibration of a, of a bee. Yeah. Yeah, which is needed to pollinate the the tomatoes, right? Um, the wild tomatoes. The wild tomatoes, yeah. Tomatoes don't need that because they're mostly self pollinating. And you've got all this information in that book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes total sense though, because the vibrator holds the 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 all the pollen will stick to the the tip of that plastic, and you can pollinate relatively fast, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, what I'm doing is using the vibrator to drop the pollen onto a spoon. Yeah. And then I have this nice little spoon that I can just take from one plant to the next. 
Interesting. So you just kind of dip your spoon into the, the plants, not necessarily taking the vibrant, getting some of the uh, pollen on and then just touching each flower, right? You're, you're, uh -huh. you're... Oh, okay. Right. So you put it in the spoon and then you use it again, right? To just get little bits of it to... So I can collect enough pollen in the spoon to pollinate 20 or 30 flowers. Yeah. Well, I've got to, I've still yet to got to get me one, the pollinator. Uh -huh. I think we should make one, a little uh, yellow and black one and, and put some little uh, wings on it so that we can maybe sell that. What do they call <laughs> that? Merchant merch, merchandise. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know how far we'll get, Joseph, but, you know, it's, a, it's an idea. <laughs> All right. Well, so we have Facebook and we have uh, josephlofthouse.com, correct? Just lofthouse.com. Oh, lofthouse.com. We'll uh -huh. put all that in the description below. And Joseph, I've got to get going here. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show here and would love to have you back anytime. Thank so you for sharing. It. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Here as well. All right. So that was pretty amazing. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but the information, the little cookies that are in this show are just fascinating they're amazing i can't wait to have joseph lofthouse on again i'd like you guys to comment let us know what you guys would like us to talk about on the next show and we're thinking about bringing him on regularly maybe every fridays or every other friday to give you guys some tips and tricks on individual species and things like that for those of you who are into survival and preparedness as we are a little bit in this show here uh what he mentioned about growing his own wheat and gr grains that sustain him for a year I think that's pretty significant. I got a lot of questions myself. I would love to have him back on, and he's agreed to come back on. So, guys, let us know in the comments. Don't forget, the links and everything are below. Uh, go check out his book. This is life-changing stuff. Uh, I've, I'm in the midst of reading it right now. I've got almost all the way through, and it has a lot of information in there. It's very simplified, and, I mean, this man's work is compiled for a few dollars in this little book that has so much information uh, guys, I can't say more than enough. Uh, this has just been a mind blower. So thanks for watching and we'll talk to you guys on the next show.